Welcome Year 11 to the virtual SHAPE presentation for Design and Technology. My name is Chris Keyes and I'm a liaison officer with the New South Wales Education Standards Authority or NESA. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we are gathered today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to acknowledge all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here with us today. For today's presentation, we are very fortunate to be speaking with three students from the 2020 HSC, whose work was selected for the SHAPE exhibition at the Powerhouse Museum. I would like to introduce you to Connor Burke. Connor designed an eco plate, Emma Smart. Emma's project is Backyard Bees and Fox McDonald, who created the Dose Guardian. So to start with Connor, could you briefly outline for the Year 11 students watching today what your project identification of a need was or the market opportunity? Essentially, how did you come up with the idea for your project? Well, it's actually a funny story. My friends at the time were vandalising my red pea plates, meaning that they were no longer legal use. That meant I was throwing away a substantial amount of plastic and collecting many more just to be wasted from Service New South Wales. At that time, I then came up with the idea, why not create a sustainable alternative? This alternative was to create change for the future of the current plastic plate program from the New South Wales government. The current market for these plates is 100% the Finsbury Green and the New South Wales government. Finsbury Green is the current manufacturer for these plates. This meant there's a substantial opportunity for the eco plate to gain traction from all the people who use that either L, P1 or P2 plates today. Great. Thank you, Connor. And I think it's great that also that you actually identified a genuine need because that's something I'm sure that many of the Year 11 students who will be getting their um, red or possibly pea plates will know that it's definitely something that's an issue. But it's also to get into the top mark range for the MDP in Year 12, you need to have a genuine need. So thank you very much. Um, Emma, we'll, we'll move on to you and your Backyard bee, Bees, which sounds like a very interesting project. Could you just explain to Year 11 your identification of the need and how you came up with that idea? Yeah, so my project was um, basically a native beehive which aimed to um, encourage like ordinary families to take up beekeeping. So I wanted to create a beehive that was environmentally friendly. So it was made out of natural materials um, and also that was like aesthetically pleasing so that it would look nice in someone's backyard um, and therefore be like more um, useful and more beautiful to have as like a statue in your garden. Um, so the need was basically the declining populations of bees like all over the world, um, honeybees and native bees. So I just addressed that need by creating my own beehive. Yeah, great. So how were you interested? How did you find that interest in bees initially? Was that something you were thinking about in year 11 or was it, you know, just something that came to you at the beginning of year 12? Yeah, so my grandfather actually keeps bees. So he has honeybees and native bees. So it's something that I've always been interested in just because I've been around um, bees since I was little. So that was sort of the initial idea. And then um, I've studied the decline of bees at school as well. So it was those two things combined. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks so much. And finally, we've got um, Fox. If you could just give the Year 11 students watching a bit of an outline about the identification of the need for your project, Dose Guardian. I came up with Dose Guardian because I personally struggle with quite severe ADHD. At the start of Year 11, I was diagnosed with severe ADHD and I had to take medication in order to combat the ADHD. I struggled to take it on time each morning and each night, but using timers on my phone wasn't enough, so it kind of came to me the idea that I should create a product that helps me take my medication on time. And when I looked further into it, into market research, I found out that there was a lot of projects like this, but none of them were quite successful. And it ended up causing about 100 billion in preventative medical costs in the US every single year, just because people don't take prescription medication on time or they take too much of it. 
So I thought I could actually expand my project to people other than myself. And I thought that could have a great effect on the world. Yep, terrific. Thank you. And again, just like the other two, uh, a very genuine need, but also something that you identified from a personal perspective initially. And that's actually a great tip for year 11 to think about something that is familiar to you and then you can expand on it. So thank you very much for that. OK, so we've had a bit of an overview of all of the different projects. Connor and Emma, your projects both focus on sustainability issues, whereas Fox, as you've just explained, yours is based on a medical need. So we might just um, have a bit, of look at, a bit of a look at that. So Connor, would you be able to explain why sustainability became an area of interest to you personally, or was it an area of interest to you personally? And was that something that you actually studied in the year 11 course initially? So sustainability to me is uh, a pathway for the future. Um, in year 11, the topic I chose was sustainable architecture and sustainable transportation. With the architecture, it was with SOPAC or the Sydney Olympic Park Aquatic Centre. It was a building built for the future whilst leading in sustainability during the Sydney 2000 Olympic Games or otherwise known as the Green Games. Many shape-changing projects like Sydney Metro allow us to get around whilst not using our cars. This was a big topic for myself, getting all that information whilst also possibly changing the future of myself. Especially with sustainability, it is a big topic, but it is the future of change and I guarantee that you will enjoy it. Yeah, terrific, thank you. And you're absolutely right. Sust sustainability is um, the future for change. Now, Emma, you mentioned to us that um, your grandfather obviously was the one who had bees. So you've been around beekeeping all the time. Um, we know, you mentioned that that's what sparked your initial interest, but were you also learning about sustainability or was there other reasons why you actually decided to go on with that project? Yeah, so, um, yeah, as I said, my grandpa was sort of the reason that I was interested in bees in the first place. Um, but I also had a family friend and I researched a bee program um, that was held by a council um, where they actually gave out native bees for free, but they were kept in these, um, they were like foam boxes, which is very, foam is like very not biodegradable and bad for the environment, also bad for the bees. Um, and so that also um, sparked my interest in coming up with a hive that was just better for the environment that would break down better um, and last longer as well. And that was, that would make the bees happy. So that was another thing um, that interests me. And yeah, just researching the bee problem at school. There's another, there's a disease called colony collapse disorder, which I research as well. So yeah, all of that combined yeah. is how I came up with okay, it. Great. <laughs> all right, thank you. So Fox, medical issues have actually been at the forefront of everyone's minds over the last year and into this year because of COVID-19. But the problem that you identified was actually something that had been um, in existence prior to COVID-19. So how did this problem first come to your attention? So it first came to my attention because of my personal reasons, the ADHD. But when I further searched it for my own personal reasons, I actually found that it was a much bigger problem than I'd expected. Um, Non-adherence affects a lot more people, particularly in the US. And in the US alone, that 100 billion medical uh, preventable costs are just completely invisible to the, the health system because when someone dies because they didn't take their medication, it's not said on their death certificate that they died because of it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's said because of their natural causes or because of the disease that they were treating. And it's estimated that about 33% of Medicaid, sorry, percent of hospital admissions are due to this not adherence. And I thought that was a giant issue and that was the perfect place for my project to go. Yeah, okay. So, and that's something about the identification of a genuine need. It actually allows you then to explore a much broader range of things as well. So it led you to actually look a bit further afield as to problems in relation to this issue. So thank you. 
All right, so let's think back to when you're a year 11 design and technology student, you're actually learning about management, okay, project management through those two smaller um, minor projects that you would have done. Um, and what I'd like you to think about is how that actually learning about management um, helped you to keep on track with your own major design projects. So the sorts of things that you actually learned about and then how you applied it to your major design project. So um, Fox, I'll actually start with you in terms of, and let's look specifically, if you could think about your finance planning and how that related to your major design project. So my finance plan was quite difficult, but what the most important thing I learned from year 11 was to predict what you think you're going to need, even if you don't necessarily use all the materials you plan with. Um, I started with a, a quite reasonable budget and I managed to stick by that for the most part. In fact, I went quite significantly underneath the budget, um, but that was mostly because I predicted what I think I would need further along and I'd cross off or tick things as I went. Uh, and it ended up being that my actual cost was significantly lower. So the year 11 project, um, we did a clock and I used a, a wooden uh, background for it and essentially I did the same thing there and I thought that tactic was quite useful. Essentially get it done at the very start and don't leave anything to the end of this. Thank you. And I love the way you said that you predicted what you thought you were going to need in terms of finance um, based on a budget. And then of course, um, it just, you modified it as you went along. Because again, in year 12 to access the top mark range, that's really what students need to do. So thank you for that response. Um, Connor, could you just tell year 11 about your time planning and how that went from being in a year 11 project to your major design project? Okay, so time management, especially during your major project is quite, you have to be quite strict with yourself. Um, so with time management, the way I used it was, is that for every bit you put in, you get something out. For those, for that time you don't put anything in, you go into debt. With that debt, you have to try and catch up. You have to repay that debt. So make sure you're always on track with your time management. That's the largest bit of advice I can give. Uh, also, going from year 11, uh, learning that strict time management, uh, particularly through one of our projects that we did, where it was a class project and we actually designed a new learning area for year 12. Uh, with that time management, we had to call out many builders. We had to deliver a time frame for when the project was going to be built, how it's going to be built, when do we have to contact these builders by. So by leading with your time management and having a strict time management time frame, it will allow you to you know, get and go with every success you have or wanting to achieve with your major project. Great, thank you so much. And Emma, if you could just elaborate a bit more, and I guess um, from what we've just been talking about, Connor's talking about time, we often talk about time and action planning together, but if you could perhaps just specifically tell Year 11 about the action plan that you implemented and how you managed to keep on track with that. Yeah, so I um, always use flow charts for my action plans throughout like the junior years and year 11 as well, which was, I think the most helpful for me because I was always able to see where I was going. So even if I got confused along the way or things didn't work out, I had like a goal um, in my folio that I could see like on paper. So that was really helpful for me. I also um, planned ahead and um, allowed for failures in my flow chart so I could see if I was to fail in one um, area, I would see where I would go back to. So it would be like, go back to research or go back to um, experimentation. Um, so it wasn't as daunting when those failures did happen. I had a plan of where I was gonna go and um, yeah, it was all visual and I could see my project on paper in front of me. So that, I think that was the most helpful and that coupled up with the time plan, plan it was sort of how I got through it. Okay, great, thank you. And thank you for mentioning about a flow chart as well, because I know how you present your time and action planning is completely up to you. Many students use Gantt charts, but you know, flow charts, tables, etc. All of the students have talked about how they predicted into the future. 
And then what you can do is just evaluate as you go through to make changes as they occur. So thank you. Now, all of you undertook a range of research, experimentation and testing into materials, tools and techniques. These um, tests and experiments have to be communicated really clearly to the HSC markers and also quite succinctly. So Connor, could you please provide some examples of how you managed to achieve this for your major design project? So with my project, a big aspect of it was creating what I call the molder. Um, I had to create this by scratch using a CNC and a various range of tools. Um, when I was putting it into my portfolio, I was ensuring that I was listing down the problem that I had before creating the molder, as I call it now, what I was doing to try and help that problem and how did I solve that problem? Whilst also, you know, using the various techniques available for us to really get into depth of how and why we used and created that product. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that if you do follow that, it will help you specifically being year 11 to you know get as much success as you can. Great, thank you. And did you find um, at the end that you had a lot of tests and like a lot of documentation? Did you actually have to cull some of it or cut some out to make it succinct and to meet the, the folio parameters? Yes, so in regards to that, the biggest thing to take away from you know finishing the major project, um, especially within the parameters of what we're given, um, in the end, I had to cull down quite a lot, um, possibly because I was either blabbering on with what I was doing and using, um, but at the same time, I had to get to the point. What was it? How was it? And how did it affect you and your final MDP? Um, and that's blatantly how it is. Yeah, terrific. And it's all about keeping it relevant and appropriate to the need. So Emma, um, you also, I've had a look at your project and you also did uh, a lot of research and testing. So how did you actually provide that evidence for the HSA markers? Yeah, so I approached it sort of as a story. So mine was very chronological. I know some people um, sort of separated their testing and experimentation. I just had it all in one big story because that's sort of what made sense to me. Um, so I, I used a diary along the way, which helped me like a journal. So I wrote down everything that I did just really roughly. And I had a lot of sketches and just lists in there that I was able to um, put into my folio in the end. So that that really helped because I could see everything that I'd done um, and then translate that into my folio um, with the pictures and everything. So um, yeah, I think that that was a good way to do it for me just as a visual person. Um, yeah. And so with your journal, you were just writing down recording evidence all the time. And then did you just take photos or, you know, to put it into your folio? How did you actually get it from the journal into the folio? Keeping in mind again, those page limits. Yeah. So I had a lot of photos as well. So that was um, my teachers really encouraged me to have a lot of photos so that they could see exactly what I was doing along the way. Mm. Um, and then those photos just went in with like the journal entries, which went into like an aim, a, what a method and a solution. And each one I would tick off or cross off in my folio as like a, as a success or a failure. And then I would go from there. Yeah, terrific. Okay, thank you. And Fox, how did you now we've both um, of the others have talked about the, the range of research, testing and experimentation. And I'm sure that you would have had a lot as well. So how did you actually select the most appropriate research, testing and experimentation to actually present to the HSA markers? So what I did for my main material research was I took photos of everything and I got way too much information and wrote way too much down. And then in the final few days, I cut everything down and the way I cut things down was I had the marking scheme open on to the right and on my left was just my entire portfolio printed out and I just redlined through everything that didn't completely match with something on that um, on that page and it's probably not the best way of doing things because often you need to go outside the box of what the markers want and you want to go above 
And I'm sure I'd probably cut out some stuff which is important, but I think that was probably what gave me the marks I needed to even be here. Mm. And I think that was pretty effective. Yeah, definitely. And I actually think it's a great tip to tell the students to actually, you know, refer to the examination criteria in the marking guidelines, because you're right, it helps you to lead to success. So well done. Okay, so lastly, I would like you to just reflect on year 11 and the work that needs to be done to achieve a successful major design project in year 12. So if you were going to give yourself some advice, um, thinking about the beginning of year 11 on how to be successful, and but also make the journey an enjoyable one, what would that advice be? So Emma, I'll start with you this time. Yeah, so I think uh, my biggest piece of advice would be to pick something that you love and that you're genuinely interested in. It's a long year of um, researching and experimenting and doing this one project. So I think it's really important to like really be interested in the topic that you've chosen. Um, another thing is be prepared for things to go wrong. I had to redo like half of my project, like halfway through, which was not fun at all. But it also was really helpful. And I think I got a lot of marks for it because it the markers love when things go wrong and you have to um, problem solve and stuff like that. Um, yeah, also just, yeah, just pick what you love. Like I always love doing woodwork through um, year 11, so I did a lot of woodwork. I loved using the laser cutter at school. At school. So um, yeah, I just picked the tools and that I love to use and I made a project out of that. Um, yeah. So great advice, Emma. Um, both of those things, something that you really love, but also I love the point that you made to the students about allow time for mistakes. Um, because you never know what's going to happen and what extra time you need to actually achieve that. Thank you. And Fox, any advice for year 11? Um, my number one point is get your portfolio, like template and everything sorted as soon as you can. Even if you have to kind of wait to have your, maybe your, in, your initial market research, get your portfolio template sorted because I spent significantly too much time on that and that just mm. took up time. And also getting your time action plan sorted early is absolutely key just so you know what you're doing and mm -hmm. essentially what Emma said, do what you like and do something that interests you. Even yeah. if it's something that you've done somewhat before, like I used Arduino for my um, uh, the, the hub of my project and mm -hmm. I've done that before and it was quite you know useful to have that information prior. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. More good advice, especially the idea of that documentation and um, keeping on top of that folio all the way through because it, it just you just will not have enough time at the end. Okay, and finally, Connor, tips for year 11? My number one tip would be to, um, how do I put it, keep on top of it and keep pushing. Um, with that, it's just to ensure that you want to get the success that you're wanting to get. Uh, one of my favorite sayings is effort equals results. So the effort that you put into year 11 and effectively your major project and the MDP will equal the results you're wanting. Do what you love and love what you do and you'll go far with whatever you want. Okay, thank you. Awesome, awesome advice. So thank you for all of your responses today. They've been incredibly insightful and I'm sure that they're going to be very beneficial to the year 11 students watching. Um, to our audience, thank you for joining the session today and good luck with your future studies in design and technology. Thank you.